Um, well, thank you all for taking uh, time out of your evening to check out this talk. Um, so we're, we're going to go on like a little bit of a virtual trip today. Uh, I'm going to talk about some research that we've been conducting in northern New England or over the past couple of decades to try and understand how our ecosystems and our trees in particular might respond to uh, future changes in climate. Um, so while a lot of the work that I'm going to be talking about uh, has taken place outside of New York City, I, I hope that maybe it sets the stage for an interesting conversation about what some of this might mean for New York City um, if, if you're interested in that sort of hyper-local -lo perspective. So when, when I was um, a master's student studying forestry in, in Maine, um, we were on a floor with a bunch of uh, wildlife ecologists. And, and when they were giving talks, they would always have these amazing pictures of large mammals that they were studying, whether it be lynx or moose or bear or something like that. And so there was always, always these pictures of charismatic megafauna. Um, and we all probably have great ideas of what this looks like in our mind. And I always studied trees and, and um, it was always you know, hard to think about, well, okay, well, what's like that charismatic equivalent of a, of a moose in a wetland or something like that? And then a few years ago, I heard a, uh, a dendrochronologist colleague of mine uh, talk about charismatic megaflora. And I was like, yes, exactly. That is a great way to describe trees. Um, and, and in my mind, there is no uh, megaflora or tree that is more charismatic than our sugar maple. Um, you know, these trees are, you know, beautiful eye candy during, during the fall season, uh, and they also produce delicious um, uh, mouth candy in the form of maple syrup and maple sugar products. And so this is going to be one of the organisms that, that I focus on a bit today. Um, so, so first, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background of how scientists and ecologists have uh, sort of approach studying how changes in climate might impact trees and ecosystems. Um, the majority of this research has focused on changes in climate that are largely expected to take place during the growing season. So in our neck of the woods, that's sort of May through September or, or October. And uh, just to kind of get everybody up to speed on our projected changes in climate, this is a figure um, from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report that comes out every seven years or so. And uh, these different lines show different model projections moving forward in time under different sort of carbon dioxide emission scenario. Um, this 8.5, that is sort of a high emission scenario. And um, sadly, that is the trajectory that we're currently on. Um, and so a lot of the different types of climate change experiments that have been conducted have sort of used uh, this temperature range as sort of the, the template. And so what this work that's focused on growing season dynamics has shown us for north temperate forests, so forests sort of throughout upstate New York and, and northern New England, is that uh, warmer growing seasons are expected to increase rates of decomposition of organic matter in the soil, which in turn would increase availability of nutrients for plants. And this could um, essentially increase the amount of nitrogen and chlorophyll in leaves and increase overall plant growth. However, um, winter climate is actually warming faster than growing season climate. And so here's a map showing um, projected changes in, in winter temperature across the US by the end of the century. And you can see that as you go further north, the magnitude of warming is expected to be larger and larger, right? So especially like the Northeast US, we're expected to see considerably more warming than the Southeast US. Um, this is important because the areas that are warming the fastest are also the areas that have uh, an important role of snow cover in mediating ecosystem processes. And so this uh, gray area and this black line are delineating globally um, where seasonal snow cover influences ecosystems. And, and what some of these analyses have shown is that um, about half of the land area in the entire Northern Hemisphere is influenced by snow at some time of the year. And the forests in those areas are responsible for about half of the global net carbon sink. So what does that mean? That means of all of the carbon dioxide that is removed from the atmosphere each year by our forests, half of that is coming from forests and areas influenced by snowpack. 
for just a little bit broader perspective, um, this has really important implications for uh, projected changes in climate because currently about uh, a quarter to a third of all of the carbon dioxide emissions to the atmosphere from burning fossil fuels are removed from the atmosphere by our forest ecosystems. So these numbers are quite important. There's also um, a large projected declines in sort of the spatial extent and the depth of snowpack across the Northern hemisphere. So this black line showing, is showing what we've seen over the past 40 years or so. You can see a steady decline. And then here, our red line is sort of the current trajectory that we're on from a climate change perspective. And you can see from these model projections by the end of the century, um, we can see about a 50%, 40 or 50% decline in the spatial extent of seasonal snow cover. Um, but until fairly recently, the year round ecological implications of snowpack decline um, weren't really um, known or well understood by the scientific community. Um, so I just spent a couple of slides talking about snow. So why are we thinking so much about snow when that's typically the time of year that the trees aren't even particularly active? So the reason for this is that snow has this really uh, incredible insulating property, um, right? So, so when we look outside after a nor'easter comes through, we look at, we say, hey, look at that beautiful blanket of snow. And, and in a lot of ways, the snow on the ground is indeed sort of acting like, like a blanket. Um, because snow is sort of um, has a lot of trapped airspace in it, much like a down blanket, it has a really amazing capacity to sort of insulate whatever is beneath it. And humans have taken advantage of this property of snow for thousands of years. Um, so indigenous peoples in Arctic regions um, made igloos and similar types of snow shelters. And even though those Arctic temperatures can get to be 50 or 60 degrees below zero, um, oftentimes these snow shelters can maintain a temperature of about 40 or even 50 degrees above zero inside just from retaining heat emitted from, from our bodies. Um, the same sort of processes happen in our forest ecosystems. Um, so what, what we and others find is that uh, sort of a deep snowpack, so snowpack deeper than 20 centimeters or about eight inches, um, prevents the development of, of soil freezing. So how does this work? During the growing season, the soils warm up. And then when we get that layer of snow, um, that deep layer of snow forming on top of it, all of the heat that is accumulated in the soil from the previous growing season leaves that snowpack really slowly. As a result of that, even though air temperatures across a lot of upstate New York and Northern New England can get to be 20, 30, or sometimes even 40 below zero, the soils in these ecosystems very rarely freeze beyond the, top, beyond the top couple of centimeters. But what we've been learning is that when that snowpack is not present, that heat leaves the snowpack much more quickly, the soil temperature becomes more tightly coupled with air temperature, and we can get the development of more frequent and deeper soil freezing. Uh, here's a map showing across the northeastern U.S. the distribution of, of this sort of deep insulating snowpack in the winter. The darker the blue indicates that that area has a much higher likelihood of developing an insulating snowpack in the winter. And then the white, um, sort of like where we're living, we have a much more intermittent snowpack um, and, and snow may not be quite as important uh, as, as insulating the soil as it is in places like the Catskills where our water source comes from or the Adirondacks or throughout uh, Northern New England. And some of our modeling work suggests that the proportion of the land area in the Northeastern US that experiences that insulating snowpack is gonna decline considerably by the end of the century. So here, this is what it looks like historically. And here on the right, these dark blues are where we can expect to still see that insulating snowpack by the end of the century. And you can see uh, how much that, that spatial extent um, is expected to shrink. So then the big question that scientists have been grappling with over the past couple of decades is ecologically, does it matter? We love to recreate on snow, it's really pretty, um, but will losing snowpack, will it have any sort of meaningful impact on the health of our trees and the health of our ecosystems? So 
Um, over the past couple of decades, there have been a series of really interesting experiments at uh, a research forest administered by the U.S. Forest Service here in, uh, in New Hampshire. Uh, this is the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest. The forest type and climate conditions there are pretty similar to what we would see across these wide swaths of northern New England and upstate New York and the Catskills. Uh, here's a, a picture of what this place looks like. It became famous in the 19... Uh, 60s and 70s through a series of what we call watershed manipulation experiments where each one of these sort of geometric shapes is, is a watershed. Um, then there's a stream flowing through that watershed and, and they've done all sorts of manipulations of these watersheds to see how it alters stream chemistry. The idea here is that the chemistry of streams going through a forest is sort of analogous to the chemistry of the blood going through our bodies. And just like you go to the doctor and they take blood and do a series of lab analyses to, to assess your health, um, scientists found that if you look at the chemistry of streams flowing through a forest, you can sort of assess the health and functioning of a, of a forest ecosystem. It was through this sort of work that scientists discovered acid rain in North America for the first time. So that's one of the things that has put this research site on the map. And there's this amazing um, uh, series of, of um, data sets that have been collected and curated since the 1950s that are largely unparalleled anywhere else in the world. And so scientists can now use that information to learn more about how our ecosystems are changing and more about how our climate is changing. Um, so through these long-term climate records, um, they have air temperature data throughout the year and analyses of those winter data show that um, whether you're at low elevations or, or high elevations, winter temperatures have increased considerably over the last 60 years or so. In fact, there's been probably about a, a um, two to three degrees Celsius increase in air temperature, which is about twice what the annual rate of warming has been. So again, our winters are warming faster than, than our summers. With these warming air temperatures, we've also seen this considerable, considerable decline in snowpack. Um, so the maximum snowpack depth has decreased by about 20 centimeters in this time period. The amount of water in the snowpack has decreased considerably, which is important if we think about um, water supply coming from the Catskills. Uh, and the, the number of days each year with snow cover has also declined by about 15 or 20 days. So we're seeing a decline in the duration of the snowpack and in the depth of the snowpack. And then over time, looking at the chemistry of, of streams um, at, at Hubbard Brook, um, one of the things that scientists are really interested in is this nutrient called nitrate. Um, it's a form of nitrogen that is super important for, for plant growth, but it also can get lost from ecosystems pretty easily. And, and it can often be used as an indicator of kind of like how leaky an ecosystem might be, which is, can then sometimes be related to the functioning and health of that system. When we look at that, those data in, in um, stream flow across years, we see these years with these anomalous spikes. And it's been posited that these spikes are years when there, were just, where there was just a low amount of snowpack and a high amount of, of soil freezing. And I'll get to that linkage in, in a second. Um, to give you a sense for what these forests look like, uh, here's a, a picture from uh, on my way up to one of our research sites up there from a handful of years ago. These forests are dominated by sugar maple trees. So again, this is our charismatic megaflora. Um, here's what the landscape would look like about two months ago. Um, and, and the area historically has had a continuous snowpack from earlier mid-December through early April. Um, and so over the past couple of decades, we've conducted what's called snowpack manipulation experiments, which is really just a fancy way of saying that um, some grad students, so here's me like 10 years ago, um, some grad students and some technicians that are uh, oftentimes underpaid, go out to the woods with a shovel every time it snows and remove a bunch of snow from the woods. Um, and this is to sort of simulate sort of a later development of snowpack and also a thinner snowpack through the winter. And here, this gives you an idea of what our reference plots that we don't manipulate looks like versus the ones that we do. And you can see we leave behind just a couple of centimeters of, of snow. Um, I always uh, like to joke with my parents when I was getting my PhD that there I was 30 years old making my living the same way as when I was 10 years old shoveling people's driveways in, in our neighborhood. 
Um, so the first of these experiments um, I was not involved in um, were, were conducted in, uh, in the late 90s. And then there's a second set of experiments that I'll talk about that I was involved in that were conducted uh, more recently in the, the late 2000s and early 2000s. So as I mentioned, for these experiments, we re removed snowpack and then we want to figure out, well, how does soil frost respond? And so we have these really cool um, tubes that's in these um, this sort of uh, flexible PVC tubing that's clear. And we put uh, this blue dye in there called methylene blue dye. Um, and when that dye freezes, it turns clear. And so we stick these in the ground in tubes and every week we can pull them out above ground and measure the distance between where the soil line is, which we put on this uh, black marker here and where, the, uh, where we see the blue again, the area that's not frozen. And we do this weekly and this allows us to make measurements of how deep soil's freezing. And then from that, we're able to generate data like this. Uh, so the open circles are our reference plots. So this is just normal snowpack conditions and the black circles are the plots that we manipulate. And what you can see, um, and we see this everywhere we do these sorts of experiments, is that when we remove snow, um, we can introduce a large amount of soil freezing. So in our reference plots, we get a little bit of soil frost in the top couple of centimeters, but we can get down uh, as deep as a, as a foot into the soil of, of creating frozen soil when we remove snow. And so um, a colleague of mine also at CUNY, Peter Grafman, um, he ran this first set of experiments. And, and because these warmer conditions that will reduce snowpack seem to increase soil freezing, um, he put together this really interesting paradigm that we might have colder soils in a warmer world. In that first suite of experiments in the 90s, what they found is soil freezing would damage and kill fine roots. So these are the, those little roots in the soil that are responsible for most of the water uptake and most of the nutrient uptake. They also found that nitrogen, again, a really important nutrient in the soil, um, gets leached or lost from the soil at much higher rates in those plots where we remove snow and there was a lot of soil freezing. Um, but exactly why this nitrogen lost, was lost was, wasn't really known um, during this first experiment. So in the second wave of similar experiments in the late 2000s, um, what that work showed is that not only was root mortality increased from, by soil freezing, but the roots that didn't die um, had a much likelier much higher likelihood of, of being damaged, right? So maybe they didn't die, but they had reduced functionality. Um, they were also able to, fi to, to um, find that the increased losses of nutrients from the soil noticed, uh, observed in the first experiment were actually because those damaged roots had a reduced capacity to take nutrients out of the soil in the spring. Um, there are also some observations that um, the growing branches in the canopy um, didn't grow as fast as, as those in, in reference plots. So soil freezing seemed to adversely impact um, canopy growth. And it also seemed to impact uh, the chemistry of the leaves. So one way that we assess this is by looking at the ratio of calcium to aluminum. Calcium is a really important nutrient for leaves. Aluminum can be toxic at, uh, in leaves. And so by looking at the ratio, you can get a sense for how healthy the plant is. Um, and here you can see there was a really large um, decline in that calcium aluminum ratio, essentially meaning that the amount of aluminum in the leaves was, was increasing. Um, and, and so what's generally been found as a threshold for a calcium aluminum ratio beyond which um, you would start to see uh, physiological impairment in sugar maple trees is at 150, right? So we've reached that threshold here. So these two series of experiments demonstrated clear impacts on tree physiology, but there hadn't yet been any work to assess the extent to which overall tree growth might be altered by, by these dynamics. It, it was possible that while roots got damaged, um, that maybe they could quickly rebuild roots without having any noticeable impact on growth. But what we did then is after five years of making the soils freeze during the winter, and then one recovery year where we just sort of let the system get back to its normal state, uh, I and, and, and a student, we went out and collected a bunch of tree cores. Um, so these are just sort of like straw shaped pieces of wood 
from which we can look at the tree rings and figure out how quickly uh, trees are growing. And so the ways that we look at these data is um, we like to kind of compare trees to themselves because just like people, trees have sort of different, different behaviors, different personalities. And so we want to kind of see how a tree is behaving relative to itself. And so we looked at um, tree growth dynamics before the experiment. And what we find is that while there's variabilities between years, um, we don't really see any differences in growth between the trees in our reference plots and the trees in the plots where we remove snow and made the soils freeze. But once we started removing snow, we start to see this divergence in rates of tree growth. And actually, we, um, within two years of the experiment, we see this huge plummet in rates of sugar maple growth. Um, uh, in fact, overall, we saw about a 40% decline in sugar maple growth uh, in, in the plots that had experienced the soil freezing compared to those that, that didn't. Um, and what the other thing that was interesting and maybe a little disheartening is that we didn't really see any rebound in tree growth even after we stopped the experiment. So it doesn't mean that the trees didn't ultimately rebound. It just sort of suggests that the damage that, that was incurred by the trees um, in response to soil freezing may take many years uh, for the trees to sort of fix and rebuild their capacity for, for growth. Then there's this other curious thing that happened, you may have noticed by looking at these data, that um, even in our reference plots, there's this sharp decline in tree growth. So what happened there? Well, during our experiment, there was um, just totally by chance another uh, sort of extreme climate event that occurred during late winter. Um, and, and what happened was in the spring of 2010, uh, the spring warmed up much faster than, than normal. Um, temperatures were about three degrees Celsius, so about five or six degrees Fahrenheit, warmer than normal across much of our region. Um, and, and that triggered um, a lot of the common tree species in these forests to leaf out a bit earlier than normal, particularly the sugar maple. Um, and so just to kind of give you a visualization of what these trees look like, here's our yellow birch, here's our American beech, and here's our charismatic sugar maple. Um, here, using weather stations across the northeastern U.S., every place where there's a dash, you can see those are the places where there, there was um, this late spring frost statement. So again, spring warmed up earlier than normal, the trees leafed out earlier than normal, and then bam, we had a late spring freeze event. And what that did was it froze and damaged most of the leaves, particularly the sugar maples across these forests. And so this is a picture of what part of Hubbard Brook looked like after that spring freeze event. All that brownish color, those are all the dead leaves. Here's a close-up of what they may have looked like. Um, and so what, what's interesting is in that year, we saw a huge decline in the amount of foliage that the trees produce. The way we measure this is we essentially put literally laundry baskets out in the woods, and then in the fall, we just collect all the leaves as they fall into them, we bring them into the lab, and then we kind of count them all. Um, and so even though the trees got damaged by that spring freeze event, they did put out a second flush of leaves, but the leaves were a lot smaller than the original ones. And in the end, the leaves that these trees had to photosynthesize were about half the size as what we would have seen in a, in a normal year. Um, but what was interesting is that the trees that um, experienced freezing um, has seemed to have a reduced capacity to put out another flush of leaves. Um, and so this decline is, was driven by that, that defoliation event. Um, but what's really important to notice here is that the trees in our reference plots that did not experience the soil freezing, they rebounded quite quickly. While the trees in our plots that experienced soil freezing, they just continued their decline. Um, and, and in fact, this freezing event um, that year, 2010, was estimated to reduce um, photo, rates of photosynthesis by about 7 to 14 percent across the, the whole forest. And um, what, what this sort of like act of serendipity, I guess, points out is that not only the soil freezing alone damaged trees, but it also seems to set the stage for them to be more adversely impacted by some other type of environmental stress that may occur at the same time. And so we get to that because we see our reference trees bounce right back 
while our uh, trees experiencing soil freezing, they just seem to exacerbate their decline. Okay, so one of the things that I like to do with my research is, you know, I'm a field ecologist. I like to go out into the woods and physically measure things, but we measure things on, on plots that are, you know, 10 to 20 meters on a side. And really what we want to know is that all that data that we're collecting that takes a lot of time, what does it mean across our whole landscape? So I thought I'd just provide a little bit of insight into kind of how that sausage is made and how we take data from a plot and use it to understand kind of regional dynamics. Um, so what we did is we started with our map of where there's an insulating snowpack. And we started with uh, a map of uh, the known distribution of sugar maple trees across the Northeastern US. So the darker the green just indicates areas where sugar maples make up a much higher proportion of the forest. So that's the Catskills, it's parts of the Adirondacks, and of course our biggest maple syrup producing state, Vermont. Um, and then we look at how um, things are expected to change by the end of the century. So here's that map that I showed you earlier. This is where we can ex expect to see insulating snow in the future. And um, on the right here in the green is forest area that has historically experiencing this insulating snowpack. And then the darker green are the areas of forest where we're still going to have that insulating snowpack moving forward in time. So again, we're really shrinking that, that forest area that um, experiences that insulating snowpack. Um, and so, so how, do we, um, how do we use all these data to quantify sort of distribution of forests and, and tree species? So um, the first thing we want to do is know where is their forest. And so there's, that, there's satellites several thousand kilometers up in space that are constantly in orbit circling the, the planet and they're taking pictures of the earth. And then some folks way smarter than me figured out a way to sort of use the color information in these images to indicate what types of ecosystem um, exist sort of across the, the US. And so here's a map of all of these different ecosystem or land cover types that are derived from these satellite images. We can zoom in a little bit and see what this looks like. So here, um, these greens are different types of forests. The reds are developed areas. So there's really a lot of detail in here. So we can use this to figure out where the forest is. And then the next thing we want to know is, well, where is their sugar maple? Um, and so to do that, we take advantage of this really amazing program administered by the US Forest Service. Um, so uh, many decades ago, the US Forest Service broke down the contiguous US into a bunch of 6,000 acre hexagons. And then within each hexagon, they would randomly locate a field plot that folks would return to every so often to quantify the um, species of trees that are there, measure the trees, things like that. It is by far the most comprehensive and amazing database, database anywhere in the world um, for forest information. Um, and and it's, it's really uh, a, an invaluable resource to a variety of different disciplines. And so we can use that information to figure out spatially where our sugar maples are, we can pair that to where we know our forests are, and that's how we develop some of these maps showing the distribution of, of sugar maple. Um, and then we can use that information in conjunction with um, our models showing areas of snowpack decline to highlight areas where we're expected to see the largest declines in snowpack and figure out where that overlaps with where there's sugar maple. And then that takes us to this map here, where basically the brighter the red indicates areas of forest that are most vulnerable to changes in snowpack because they have this combination of high amounts of sugar maple and are expected to see large amounts of uh, decline in snowpack. Um, and so these are areas we can think about either from a management perspective or from an industry perspective that might warrant some sort of, of attention to try and ameliorate some of the most adverse impacts of projected changes in climate. Just to give you a few other perspectives on how declining snowpack impacts forest ecosystems, I was focusing on large mature trees in the canopy, but there's also been some work from Canada that suggests that uh, this can impact forest regeneration. So here we're looking at two species of maple, so red maple, which we find all over the place in New York City, and sugar maple, which is um, which exists in New York City, but is less common. 
And what they did is they did these snow manipulation experiments like I was uh, showing you. And then they looked at um, areas of natural snow cover in two other locations in Canada and just sort of compared um, rates of, of regeneration of these different species. And for both species, you see um, the lowest re uh, germination in areas where the snow is removed. And this is particularly striking for, for sugar maple. Um, and so this might be due to some amount of frost tolerance of, of the seed. So even though these trees are native and thrive in cold climates, um, it's clear that, that they rely quite heavily on that insulating snowpack to sort of complete their life cycle. Um, this work also suggests that um, even once those, those seeds germinate, that seedling survival is also adversely impacted by losses of snow, right? So for both red maple and sugar maple, when you lose that snowpack, um, that snow is no longer there to protect those sensitive developing seedlings during those cold winter months and rates of mortality can increase. Um, and, and it could also be, um, not only are the above ground parts exposed to colder temperatures, but that soil freezing is impacting a larger proportion of the roots of these, of these seedlings because they're, all their roots are confined to the tops of the, the soil. Okay, so from the work that I've showed, that I've just shown you from about the impacts of declining snowpack and winter climate and uh, work that had been done before, um, looking at how a warmer growing season impacts trees, we find that there's sort of these opposite responses, right? Warmer growing conditions seem to increase nutrient availability, increase tree growth, while declines in winter snowpack and increases in soil freezing um, seems to reduce nutrient availability for trees and reduce uh, tree growth. So then what happens um, in like sort of the real world when we simultaneously have warmer growing season conditions and maybe an increase in, in soil freezing dynamics during the winter. So to study that in 2012, we started um, this new experiment at Hubbardbrook called the Climate Change Across Seasons Experiment. Um, every good experiment needs an acronym and this was the best that we can come up with. So we just call it C-CASE. And so what we did here is like all of our experiments sort of we have our control where we don't do anything to those plots. And then we have a series of plots that we, where we warm the soils during the growing season to simulate projected increases in growing season temperature. And then we have another suite of, of plots where during the growing season, we warm conditions, but then during the winter time, we induce a series of freezing and thawing cycles in, in the soil. And then these plots are meant to collectively represent um, sort of tree response to these changes in climate that would occur both during the growing season and, and during the winter. Um, here's just sort of a distribution of what these plots look like. Um, and in each of these plots, we um, made sure there were at least three mature red maple trees. Ideally, we wanted to use sugar maples, um, but the logistically that was quite difficult to do for this experiment. We had to run electricity out to our experiment, which greatly reduced the areas we can put a site. And, and this area just happened to have more red maples than sugar maples. So that's what we focused on. Um, and then we, we've collected some thermal images of our plots and you can see these sort of stripes. That's where all of our heating cables are buried in the soil. So the way we warm the soils is uh, maybe some of you have radiant floor heating in your homes and those heating cables that are used for radiant floor heating are exactly the same thing that we've sort of laced through the soils in the forest to create this climate manipulation. Um, so here I'm showing you some temperature data from these plots so you can get a sense for how our treatments impact uh, temperature in, in sort of in real life. Um, the green are our sites that have the freeze thawing and so you can see um, it going ab above and below zero several times throughout the winter. Um, and then during the growing season, um, our two types of plots that were warmed, they have about the same temperature and our reference plots are always right about five degrees Celsius cooler. And so in this experiment, we're measuring a whole suite of things. We're looking at how uh, microbes are responding in the soil. We're measuring things like tree level photosynthesis, rates of sap flow, which is just the rate of water movement through the tree. 
Um, we're measuring rates of respiration on the trees. We're measuring rates of tree growth and overall forest productivity. And we also measure things like carbon dioxide coming out of the soil from soil respiration, which is sort of uh, a combination of decomposition of organic matter in the soil and respiration happening in the roots. Um, and we're also looking at uh, soil nutrient dynamics. Um, so just as, as a reminder here, um, studies that have only looked at changes in winter climate, like the studies I initially started telling you about, they find that when you remove, when you have lower snowpack and more soil freezing, that can have sort of this wide range of impacts on soil respiration, um, but it can reduce nutrient uptake by trees and also reduce rates of tree growth. We contrast that to research um, where they just warm soil, so they're mimicking uh, warmer growing season conditions. That seems to stimulate rates of decomposition and possibly also root activity in the soil, which results in higher soil respiration. It can increase availability of nutrients in the soil and then uh, nutrient uptake by trees, and that can also increase tree growth. So with the seacase experiment, again, we wanted to see what happens when you combine these things together. So um, from a tree perspective, we've been um, putting out, I remember I told you we use laundry baskets to quantify leaves. Here's a picture of one of our laundry baskets. Um, and in the fall, all the leaves fall into them and then we take them into the lab and, and we count them all. And that's the, our way of quantifying um, how much foliage the tree produced each year. Then we use these um, fancy measuring tapes that have springs attached to them uh, that are kept in one place on each tree. As the tree grows, these measuring points get further and further apart from one another, and that allows us to quantify rates of tree growth. Uh, and we did this on a large number of trees uh, in, in our plots. And so first I'm gonna show you how uh, these different treatments impacted tree growth. And so what I'm showing you is cumulative rates of tree growth over time. I'm only showing you data through 2019, but the data we have from the last two years, the pattern is the same. So of course, since this is cumulative rates of tree growth in our reference plots, we see um, what we would expect that our trees are growing. When we looked at our, uh, look at our warm treatment, we find that over this time period, um, probably from uh, warmer growing conditions and increases in nutrient availability, tree growth is about 50% higher uh, than it is in our reference plots. But what's really interesting is that when we take those those trees and we warm them during the growing season, but then we expose them to soil freezing during the winter, it offsets most of those increases in tree growth. And we find similar patterns when we look at rates of, of leaf production. So overall, we find that um, warming increases overall rates of, of tree growth and productivity, but when we introduce um, those changes in winter Time, it offsets most of those stimulatory effects of warming. Um, next, I want to show our, our soil respiration data. Um, so here's just a, an image of, of how we measure that. This is really important. This is the largest source of carbon dioxide in, in a forest. And the amount of carbon that a forest stores or sequesters each year is really the difference between this respiration signal and how much is taken up through photosynthesis, which is why this is a parameter we often measure. Um, and what we find, again, this is sort of cumulative amounts of carbon being lost from the soil through respiration. So over time, that increases in our reference plots. We see nearly a 30% increase in carbon being lost from soils in our warm plots. This is likely from increases in rates of decomposition, but it's also possible that increased rates of root activity contribute to this. And when we um, combine warming during the growing season with soil freezing during the winter, it completely offsets the stimulatory effects of warming alone. Um, one of the other things that we've been looking at is nutrient availability in the soils and how uh, these treatments might affect that. So um, one of the ways that we do this is we bury these little bags. This is actually just a cutout of a stocking. And we put all these little plastic beads inside that have all of these negative charges or positive charges around it. And then different forms of nutrients, different forms of nitrogen stick to them as they're going through the soil. And we can pluck them out of the soil every now and then um, just to get a sense for how much nitrogen and other nutrients are moving through the, through the soil. 
And what this work shows us is um, here I'm showing you this nitrogen uptake by roots on the x-axis, and then this um, uh, variable called relative electrolyte leakage on the x-axis, which is really just a metric of root damage. So the idea is that as roots get damaged, um, different materials start oozing out of them, um, different types of electrolytes. And so we can use that to measure how, uh, how damaged our roots are. And what we find is that um, while warming and our reference plots, there's not really any difference in the capacity of trace of take of nutrients when we have those free thaw cycles, even though those plants are experiencing those warmer conditions during the growing season, they still have a reduced capacity to take up nitrogen. And so what's probably happening is um, uh, during the winter time, those freezing and thaw cycles are damaging tree roots, which is reducing their capacity to take up nutrients, which then reduces their capacity to grow during the growing season. And any sort of benefits that the tree may experience from warmer conditions are not sufficient to offset that. Um, uh, when uh, we, we had this sort of like sibling sapling experiment to compare sugar maples and red maples to the similar types of, of treatments. Uh, again, I'm showing you that metric of root damage. So the lower the value, the lower the root damage, the higher the value, the higher the root damage. And in this experiment, we were able to not just look at it as a binary soils freezing or not freezing, but we can see sort of how many times the soils froze throughout the winter and how that impacts um, the, the, the trees or the saplings. And what we find is that red maples seem to be a bit more robust against some of the soil freezing dynamics than the sugar maples, where um, the more amounts or the more frequency of freezing that the sugar maple roots experience, the more damage their, uh, their roots experienced. Um, I apologize for the quality of this figure uh, in the publication itself. It was really blurry, so there wasn't much I can do about it. Um, but um, the, the other thing uh, that was explored in these saplings was stem damage. Um, and this was really interesting. So what my colleagues found was that when, um, when snow depth was low, there was very little damage to the tree stems during the winter. But when snowpack was deep, there was a lot more damage, which we didn't really expect. And that damage took the form of like little gnawing marks from, um, from small mammals and small rodents. Um, and so, so actually what happens is when the snowpack is deep, there's lots of little mam mammals sort of burrowing through the, through the, the snow. And just like we really love maple syrup, these little small mammals are gnawing on the stems of sugar maple trees to get all of that, that sucrose there. And so as a result of that, there's more damage to the stems when there's deep snowpack, much more so than in red maples, which don't have nearly as high sugar content in, in their sap. Um, so this was not something that we set out to study. It was just something that we sort of found by, by chance and kind of highlights the kind of the complex interactions between winter climate animals and, and plants. Um, all right, so just to kind of summarize, I wanted to um, start with kind of like what scientists' classical view is of how climate change impacts tree growth. And that, ha again, has been focusing on warmer growing season conditions. So when we have warmer growing seasons, that increases rates of decomposition of leaves and dead plant material and things like that. Um, as that material decomposes, it frees up nutrients, so it increases availability of nutrients to trees in the soil. The trees can then take that up and then grow faster. Um, and so we have these nice big happy trees. Um, when we look at the impacts of warmer winters alone, um, we found that when you get a lower snowpack, the soils are more likely to freeze. The frozen soils then uh, kill roots and re reduce their vitality which then in turn reduces the capacity of trees to take up nutrients. Um, because they had a lower capacity to take up nutrients, there's more nutrients being lost from the ecosystem. So you're over time reducing the fertility of those soils. And all of this seems to result in lower rates of tree growth. Um, so here's our, our smaller, less happy tree over here. Um, so historically it was viewed that, you know, you should have looking at this or this. With our seed case experiment though, we were able to kind of look at the interactions of these different changes in climate across seasons. And so what we find is that warming during the growing season uh, can increase soil respiration and tree growth, 
but those stimulatory effects of a warmer growing season seem to be offset by soil freezing from reduced snowpack during the winter. Um, but that's sort of like a chicken or the egg thing, like which is offsetting which, right? So another way of thinking about it is maybe if we're more optimistic here, damage uh, uh, incurred by trees from soil freezing during the winter, maybe that's being offset by warmer growing conditions in the, in the growing season. Um, and then just to make things even more complicated, of course, um, these changes in, in winter and growing season temperatures aren't the only changes in climate that are, that are happening. We're also seeing changes in precipitation. So the severity of drought uh, seems to be increasing. Um, and, and so really how are all of these things maybe working together to influence sort of the future health of our trees and our forests? Um, and then here I was focusing a lot on sugar maple, but of course that's not the only tree in our forest. So thinking about how these different species interacting uh, is also really important. Um, so we've all heard this slogan, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Um, and, and there's not really a winter analog to that. Um, what we find is that what happens in winter does not stay in winter. And if we really wanna understand how climate change is going to impact our trees and impact our ecosystems, we really need to take into account how changes in climate across our different seasons uh, might be impacting these important processes. And so with that, um, all this work is not just me, there's a team of people that have been helping out with this and a bunch of different funding sources. And so I am happy to open it up to, um, to questions and discussions and uh, whatever else you want from me. And, and I put my email address here if I don't cover in the discussion something you have a question about, please feel free to email me. Great, thanks so much for this talk, Andy. Um, sure. I, I know that this is something that I was, I was surprised to read at first in the, the abstract that, you know, the kind of paradoxical, what you wouldn't expect that the less, um, less snowpack would lead to this, this kind of effect. So I think, you've probably opened a lot of people's eyes um, as you know we saw in a couple of the comments um, saying as such. So we do have a couple of questions, um, some of which are questions that I also have. Um, and so if anyone else has any other questions, if you want to put them in the chat or if you would like to actually um, to, to put on your mic or and, and, and speak, uh, you could raise your hand and I'll be able to call on you. Um, but so we'll go through some of the stuff that's in here first. Um, so we have a couple questions from Ellie. Um, the first one I want to address is about the, the um, distribution of the sugar, sugar maples. So um, what kind of, she says, uh, interesting distribution of sugar maples, the much lower density in Eastern New Hampshire and Maine is notable. Um, what factors biological um, or ecological contribute to the difference um, and especially to do with the the different mountain ranges and the bodies of water and stuff that are all around that area? Yeah, so, so that's a great question. So um, sugar maple um, really likes um, nutrient rich soils with a lot of calcium in them. And so while we see them across the whole region, they become most dominant, most common in areas where the soils are a little bit better. So New Hampshire, the granite state, um, granite is not known for producing nutrient rich soils. And so um, particularly in some parts of the state where it may be underlain by granite or the soils might be sandy closer to uh, the, the coast, those are not ideal soils for sugar maple. And so the abundances just drop a little bit. Um, by contrast, Vermont is underlain by um, limestone and metamorphosed versions of limestone that have a lot of calcium in it. And so we see um, large areas dominated by, by sugar maple trees. In the case of Maine, um, the western part of the state where it's more mountainous has soil conditions that are more amenable to sugar maple growth, while the eastern part of the state, like the downeast part by the, by the coast, has um, more acidic soils that are more nutrient poor, and those forests tend to be more dominated by conifers like, like spruce and fir. Um, also, there's a really strong maritime influence in the summer, which creates uh, much cooler growing season conditions that make it more similar to the types of summers that would exist in the boreal forest. And so you get more of a boreal type of forest in that area. Nice. All right. Um, <clears throat> another question that we have uh, from Ellie um, 
is leaf count or weight a more accurate measure of the seasonal leaf output? Yeah, so um, I guess I, I presented it in a, in a slightly overly simplistic way, but so generally it's the mass of leaves that is probably most important. And, and so usually um, we're not just counting the leaves, but we actually weigh the leaves. Um, and, and the thing, the metric that is most important from a photosynthetic perspective is what we call leaf area index. So it's sort of like the total surface area of leaf in, in the forest. So it's not the mass, it's not the number, but if you were to kind of like push all the leaves together and almost make like a leaf fruit roll up where you just kind of roll it all out and you have this big layer of leaf, what's that, what's that surface area? That's the metric that's most important for, for productivity. And we calculate those sorts of metrics with that litter fall data. That's a great question. And something, I, I guess there's some inherent um, assumption that you're not collecting, I guess, all of the leaves. Cause I'm just thinking functionally, if you have, you know, you're trying to collect in a radius, what if there's a big gust of wind, they'll blow, blow some of the leaves away. Um, but I guess that's yeah. you know, built into that. So there's problems with every method we have for quantifying um, the amount of leaves, the mass of leaves or the leaf area in, in the forest. So really quickly, a couple of different approaches is we take um, uh, hemispherical photos in the forest with like fisheye lenses, and then we can use some imaging processing software to quantify how much light is passing through the canopy and use that to estimate leaf area. Um, there's similar types of light sensors we can walk through the forest with to estimate leaf area. And then there's this approach that I mentioned here where we put out litter baskets of known dimensions and we put a bunch of them in our plot and the assumption is that if our baskets are sort of randomly distributed in our plot, um, then collectively they should be representative of the leaf material produced by the whole plot. So we can take those subsamples and then scale it up to the plot if we know the dimensions of our, our collection receptacles, I guess. Um, and there is always this potential problem with leaves blowing out of the baskets. And so, um, especially during sort of peak leaf drop season, we get out there to remove these leaves once a week or even more frequently than that to minimize that artifact. Interesting. All right, um, we have another question um, from Steve. Uh, does the loss of understory by overabundance of deer uh, affect snowpack at all, or could this be a confounding factor? So, um, I don't, I don't know that the deer themselves of, are affecting snowpack much, but what I can say is um, in areas where you um, might normally have a deep snowpack, um, if you have a lot of deer, you probably lost a lot of your regeneration potential in the forest from over browsing. And if on top of that, declines in snowpack are gonna increase over winter mortality, that could be sort of like the one-two punch that can all but eliminate regeneration of our forests. And, and in lots of areas of the Eastern US, we're close to having regeneration failures because of, of heavy deer browsing. Um, close to New York City, maybe some of you have been to places like Harriman State Park, and, and you may notice that very like open park-like feeling of the forest understory. None of that is natural. That's just because there's been so much deer browsing for decades that there's no regeneration in the forest and when trees start falling down, there's not really much there except for invasive species that take their place. So I think there could be these interactions between deer browsing and declines in snowpack that can further impact forest regeneration. Yeah, if nothing else, it kind of reveals again how complex all of these different factors are together. You know. Yeah, that's what keeps us employed. <laughs> <laughs> um, on, on the similar note with that, um, there's a question of whether um, would extra leaf litter um, potentially compensate for some of that snowpack loss to kind of help insulate the soils? Yeah, that's a great question. So for sure, um, a thick leaf litter layer provides some amount of insulation capacity. Like we see this a lot anecdotally in the forest, um, like especially the first handful of really cold nights in the early part of the winter before the snowpacks developed, areas that have that thick litter layer um, you don't really see any soil freezing, while the more exposed areas do have soil freezing. Um, so, I, so I think during sort of like the shoulder times of years, that, that can be important. I suspect, though, that um, in the absence of a, of a snowpack, in many of these regions, the winter temperatures are cold enough and for long enough 
that eventually that cold air will perm permeate that you know couple of inches of, of leaf litter layer and still result in, in soil freezing. Um, you know, one thing related to that that we experience a lot here in New York City is we have all these invasive earthworms. So none of our earthworms are native. Um, they all got, all of our native earthworms were extirpated long ago when the glaciers came through. And the earthworms we see now are from Europe and Asia, and they can totally decimate the leaf litter in, in the forest understory. Um, and so you may notice in a lot of forests in New York City, um, no matter when you go there, there's very little leaf litter on the forest floor. And so certainly the loss of what used to be maybe an inch or two of leaf litter um, is eliminating, you know, some amount of buffering capacity with, with cold temperatures. Um, and, and so, you know, there, it's another indication of how complex these interactions are, right? It's not, it's not just the climate, but there's also these other aspects of environmental change that we're introducing that, that can sort of interact with climate to exacerbate some of these problems. All right, another question we have um, from Natalia. Have you thought about including some plant functional traits in your analysis, such as seed size or root density? Yeah, so um, we've explored um, different tree functional types. So we've looked at sugar maple and we've looked at red spruce. Um, red spruce is a much more shallow rooted tree with um, a denser fine root network closer to the surface. Um, and, and so functionally they're, they're quite different. We find that sugar maple is more adversely impacted than red spruce is. Um, and there could be a variety of reasons for that. Like maybe it's, it's spruce, um, you know, sort of its lineage is in boreal forest trees that, you know, survive areas with permafrost. And so maybe there's some sort of adaptation there. Um, it, you know, but it could also be just some fundamental difference between gymnosperms and angiosperms. And I, I'm, I'm not quite sure um, the, the answer to that. Um, Lydia is our gymnosperm expert. So maybe she can, she can help out with that. But yeah, I think, I think understanding um, plant functional types and the role that they play here is really important. Um, another thing that, that's really important that I hope we'll start studying with a colleague of mine at, um, at, at City College of New York. Um, and that is that, so all of this work has been looking at sugar maples in cold places like Northern New England. But you can find sugar maples in New York City. You can find sugar maples in the mountains all the way down to Georgia. And many of these places don't have that insulating snowpack throughout the winter. So how are they apparently doing just, just fine? Um, and, and so it's possible that while the species is the same, there's different sort of uh, morphologies or root morphologies um, or some amount of phenotypic plasticity at play in different populations of sugar maples. So maybe if we took a sugar maple tree from New Hampshire and moved it to New York City or to the Southern Appalachians, um, maybe it wouldn't do very well. Um, but if we took a sugar maple tree from, from the Southern Appalachians and moved them further north and froze the soils, maybe they would do okay because that soil freezing might be something that, that they're more used to. So, so I think the plant functional type is important. And I also think, especially for species that have a fairly wide geographic and climate range, thinking about how the populations might differ and how that factors into their response to different aspects of climate change. Really cool That's question. And that's something that I didn't even think of too, right? Is that even there's between the different species and then within that species too, there could still be, yeah, range across, very interesting. Yeah, I mean, um, I think we, in, in like in, in my own house, um, my partner and I are comfortable at very different temperatures in our house. We are the same species, but we have very different, you know, comfort zones for climate. And there's no reason to think that, that trees might not also be the, the same way. Yeah, and so that might be something, right, uh, I guess, in more of an applied sense of trying to um, catch up with climate change to see those kind of transplant experiments um, right. could be a, a good thing to, to do and have them then maybe also inter, interbreed with each other that it could kind of uh, introduce that into this population. Yeah, um, so, yeah there's ways to maybe jumpstart that climate migration thing. Exactly. Um, we have a question from Bob about the um, the design of the the study about the snowmelt system. So, um, you know, when how deep did you bury um, those heating tubes beneath the ground, and how fast did the snow uh, melt? And I guess also that compared, did it fully melt compared to the kind of snow removal where you were shoveling most of the snow away? Does that have an effect between those two? Yeah. Points? 
So, so for the sake of time um, and, and hoping to not overly bore everybody, I skimped a little bit on some of the details. So those heating cables were put about 10 centimeters down into the soil. Um, and, and those frost tubes, I'm um, oh, sorry, and, and then the, the snow removal piece, we didn't rely on just the warming to melt the snow because it takes way too long to melt the snow. Um, but what we did was we would manually remove the snow with shovels the same way we did in our snow removal experiments, let the soils freeze, um, and then we would turn on our heating cables, which then thawed them out. And so we can use that approach to control those freezing and thawing cycles. Interesting. So I guess the, the snow will melt slower than I guess we would think again with this kind of insul insulation. Um, yeah, snow melts um, quite slowly and, and just warming up the soils while it does melt and it will over time, it takes a really long time um, for, for that to happen. Hmm, interesting. Um, and I guess just to kind of bring it back a little bit then to um, what kind of impacts this might have in more of our region, I guess, because we don't have this kind of persistent snowpack. Uh, and in fact, I guess at this, you know, by, by now we kind of will have kind of several big storms that will have a bunch of snow and then it'll last for a little while and then kind of, uh, but much more intermittent, like, uh, what, do, what do you think we could expect to see come maybe a less less severe version of what's going on more more north of us or yeah so this is something that is um, a super interesting thing, interesting thing to think about for me so first when you look at kind of where we see the highest abundances of, of sugar maples it is closely aligned with um, where there's that persistent winter snow it's not that we don't see them other places they're just able to sort of dominate in places where there's a lot of winter snow. So I would expect then also that as our climate warms and our winter climate warms, um, whatever sugar maples currently exist in New York City, um, moving forward in time, their representation on our landscapes will, will decline. Um, there's other important things about cold winters beyond just the snowpack, right? Like it's really important in keeping down different types of forest pests and pathogens. And so there's a lot of concern that warming winters will allow different types of pests to persist um, in ways that they weren't able to in our climate before. And New York City is already an epicenter for invasive species. And so, you know, that just magnifies the potential threat of, of warming conditions. So for example, just at the New York Botanical Gardens, there used to be this beautiful old growth stand of hemlock trees. And those trees are all but dead now because of an introduced insect called the hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, and what we know is, is one of the things that has controlled the spread of, of that insect, at least moving further north, is cold winter temperatures. So that's a really clear example of how warming winters, regardless of the snowpack component, can exacerbate other aspects of, of, um, of stress to the, to the forest ecosystem. Um, and so I, I, I think we can probably expect that um, a wider variety of forest pests will become problematic in the future through a combination of, of invasive species and our warming climate that just doesn't keep uh, many of these organisms at bay over the winter. And I guess, um, so going off of that, is there any, doesn't have a very good, I guess, a, a good uh, prospect kind of outlook, but at the same time, I guess there, we might underestimate the resiliency of some of these ecosystems that just because they won't be exactly the same as they are now, doesn't mean that they won't be able to kind of reshuffle and. Yeah, you know. that's that, that's right. And, um, you know, there's ways to think about this. There's like, well, how is a species gonna respond? And that sometimes is fundamentally different than how is the ecosystem gonna respond? And, and New York City is at, um, you know, this really interesting crossroads, like not only is it like this, this center of human diversity, it's this real center of, of tree diversity, right? We're at the northern edge of the range of a lot of different tree species and the southern edge of the range of a lot of other different tree species. Um, and, and so maybe, maybe there's some, some sort of resilience that's built in there. Maybe what we see over time is not like a loss of forest, but rather, um, like Lydia, was, you were saying, like a reshuffling of kind of who's there, right? And, and some of the species like sweet gum, where we're at the northern edge of the range, maybe they start becoming even more common than they are now. 
uh, while we're losing things like like sugar maple and some of those more more northern species. Um, there's also a lot of people hard at work on, on topics called like a, um, adaptive silviculture, where they're experimenting with different forms of forest management in urban systems to make them more climate resilient. And part of that could be um, starting to plant different types of tree species that are normally found a little bit further, further south of here, but to kind of help jumpstart the system instead of um, waiting for uh, these sort of like natural migration and natural selection processes to take hold, we can jumpstart that. And I think it's our urban forest where that's most important because, you know, sort of acre for acre, we ask more of our urban forest than of any other type of forest. And we don't have that much forest. Like we pick out, what is it, something like 10,000 acres or so of forest in New York City. Um, but, but relative to the size of New York City, it, it, it's not a ton. And so there, there is probably value in, in trying to think about how do we manage these forests to ensure their climate resiliency.